Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, I'm Dr. John D. Martini, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. My gardeners are right outside my tent door. <laughs> it's so loud over here. <laughs> but hey, you know, you, you have to continue to push on and drive forward. It's what's one of the benefits of being live is that it's uh, there's random variables. In the day. Hey, uh, you're an incredible dude. I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, I love what you do. I've been listening to all your stuff and your beginning story. You know, you're like one of those superhumans where it came together for you in a time later than what a lot of kids happen. Can you kind of just really briefly... Give us that incredible background and then like that, that launching of like, I've read 32,000 books. Kind of work us through that initial <laughs> process while I shut up and make my, hopefully the lawnmower guy will be done. <laughs> well, I had a bit of a challenge in the beginning. I was born with a, an arm and leg deformity and a speech impediment. And I was had to wear braces on my arms and legs and also use buttons and strings in my mouth to exercise it. When I was in first grade, I was told by my first grade teacher I would never be able to read, never be able to write, probably never be able to communicate effectively, probably not go very far in life, not amount to much. I only made it through school, elementary school, because I asked smart kids a lot of questions, and that allowed me to pass until I was 12, going on 13. And then I moved to a small town where there was a low socioeconomic, wasn't a bunch of smart kids. And I end up dropping out. And so I end up a street kid when I was 13. And um, at 14, I hitchhiked from Houston, Texas to LA back in the 60s, went out to surf, went to Huntington Beach, surf capital. I went down to Mexico for the summer in California. 15, I ended up going to the North Shore of Oahu to surf. Surfing was my thing. And I was surfing there till I was nearly, well, 18 almost, and uh, 18. And I nearly died there. And in the recovery of nearly dying, I was led to a little class where I met Paul Bragg. And Paul Bragg, in a one hour presentation, shifted my whole paradigm and made me believe that maybe I could overcome my learning problems and someday become intelligent. I hadn't read a book yet. I had learning problems. But after meeting him and believing that I could possibly do something more, my life changed. Now, just as you have a lawnmower guy, I just had somebody knock on my door. Give me one second. I'll cover while John does this. So, yeah, John does this incredible thing where, you know, he struggled with reading, he struggled with braces on his feet and everything. And then once those braces come off, and, you know, John, this is the thing that doesn't happen anymore. We don't see those kids with braces like we had a kid that had one leg was shorter than the other and his legs were permanently in a bar and so he could run all around the play yard but his legs were always triangle all the time and then one day you know he had outgrown the braces and we don't see the braces technique anymore i, I hopefully we're better at it now or something yeah i don't know i maybe i'm not around it but um i certainly had that challenge i had to wear a dunce cap when i was in kindergarten first grade actually and then i had um I had to wear braces when I was starting at one and a half to four. So I did have some challenges there, but all that is on the way. Cause if it wasn't for that, I probably wouldn't have a desire to travel the world to be free. The idea that I'm a professional speaker and now a voluminous reader and I've traveled around the world and done 20 million miles, all the things that I was told I wouldn't be able to do probably was catalyzed me to do that. So I, I, I always say anything you can't say thank you for is baggage. Anything you can say thank you for is fuel. So I, I'm, I'm grateful for all those, those bit of challenges. I wasn't so grateful at that time, but I'm certainly grateful looking back at it now. Yeah, when you look back at the path, you needed to go there. There are so many people that have done incredible things. And then, like, so I, I, uh, because I'm a combat guy, I know a lot of SEALs and that kind of thing. And they'll find some kind of mission post being a SEAL. And then they start to realize I had to do all of that SEAL stuff that was crazy and hard and fun to get to this truly hard thing. You know, like a couple of these guys work in the human trafficking space trying to end that. 
And that's not an easy thing because you can't just out muscle. You have to be constantly vigilant in several different ways. And it's just impossible to do these things well. Yeah, you've, you've, there's, I want to say that the magnitude of the challenge and problem that you're pursuing to, chant, to, to solve determines the, your character and what you're capable of doing in your life. And so they were, as SEALs, they were put under responsibilities that very few people have the opportunity to, to really have to find out what they're capable of doing. And then that carries over into following a mission that makes a difference in the world. And sometimes only somebody who's been through that training could do it. One of the things I think about a lot is, is as we get more stable, more wealthy as a nation, uh, you know, and, and then in a lot of nations around the world, things are, the problems are a higher level. Like I, I read a stat today about the increased number of bisexual people. That's simply not possible in the Middle East. Like you can't just say, I'm bisexual unless you want to be dead. You know, like that's, you know, I, I talked to a guy um, who's in Iraq and he was saying, like, hey, I'm so glad the Americans are here. You've given us freedom. And then literally the next topic, he's like, the other day I had to beat my daughter because she was on the roof too long for putting out the laundry. And it wasn't that she was a whore. It was that if he didn't handle that business, anybody who was looking at them, they would become a target. You know, so her exposure on the roof to him forced him to put him in a position where he had to act in a way that was completely irrational. So we don't have these kind of problems. We have different problems. But there's still problems. How do you how do you sort out what's important and what's not? How do you keep track of the fact that when people say the one percent, it's like we all are the one percent. You know, we I turn the faucet on. If the water's too cold, I don't even put my hand in it. It just goes straight down the drain. And this is a resource that would be invaluable to most of the world. Well, how do you prioritize your life is based on your own individual value system. And from a very young age, you're developing it from all the experiences you have. And there's, I don't like to say there's a right or a wrong value system. I think there's just a value system that each of us have. We have a full spectrum of values across society. Some people are dedicated to spiritual causes, some to mind, intellectual pursuit, some business, some finance, some family, some social, some physical health and well being. I don't think it's wise to, to judge anybody's value system. They all have a place. The world needs everybody's value system to make it work. But we tend to think that ours is right and everybody else's need to need to grow up and finally be more like us sometimes out of our ignorance. But I think that uh, having a resilient, adaptable appreciation of all the varieties of values that people have is essential. And, you know, it's interesting. I was in Iran and there was a lady who was the girlfriend of the gentleman who was driving me there. And she, her hair was not properly set underneath the, whatever the cover is. So she ducked down and tried to get it. And her boyfriend had to make sure nobody was watching because they'll report her his license number for having her hair exposed. Right, right. And, and I was thinking, wow, <laughs> you know, we have the benefit of the freedom of that. But at the same time, they can be out at three or four in the morning and nobody's going to rob them. And girls can walk on the street. And nobody's going to, you know, steal from them where you might not have that freedom. You have less of those challenges because of the strictness of those rules. But at the same time, you have less freedom. So it's a matter of a trade off of which ones are you willing to, to take and which ones you let go of. So I, 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 I like because I'm probably a bit biased. I probably appreciate the freedoms of America for sure. But at the same time, I can see the pros and cons of that. That freedom, because some people don't have self-governance very well. And if they're not in their executive center and governing themselves and they're in their amygdala, sometimes you have to have outside governance to govern people. And I'm a firm believer in trying to educate people to help them maximize their own self-governance, self-reliance. Yeah. Self-reliance is, uh, let me go a different direction with this. And again, back on the stability platform. There's a lot of things to mind in our overall well-being. Like you know, you're pouring books into your head to increase your your mental capacity and, and knowledge of, of the world and everything. But we've because we're moving away from religious backgrounds, less and less people go to church every year. And this is not a faith, it's just across the board. How do we mind our spiritual needs? How do we take care for these things 
you know, and, and then like I got my daughter, she's got her lessons. I've got to, you know, do this work for my boss. I got, I got, I got, I got all these priorities. And it's easy not to take care of the body, the mind and the soul like we need to. Well, I don't like to put a box around what spirituality is. I've seen people who are raising beautiful children and dedicated to raising a magnificent family as their spiritual quest. And they are not necessarily a traditional or conventionalist in the sense of spiritual religious ideals. They're, they're inspired by raising a beautiful family. I've seen others that are in, in serving vast numbers of people in business. I've seen people that are, I know a friend of mine that uh, has climbed all the mountains, the Himalayas. He's gone up to Everest four times to the top of Everest, twice to the seven peaks of the world. He's climbed to the North and South Pole. He's hiked to it. And he swam the Amazon River. He's, he's an adventurer. And that's his spiritual quest. Right. I've seen other people that are very much businesses that are that way. I've seen intellectual pursuits that under, want to understand existentially, you know, what is the ground of being from a physical, metaphysical perspective. I like to think of as anything that truly is meaningful, that inspires you, that makes you, you know, grateful for life to me is a spiritual quest. And I don't want to put it into just a religious traditionalism because I think that's that's a bit finite. And that's adapting and changing because people are now catching on that there's something more than sort of an anthropomorphic religious dogma that's that was used at one time, as Porphyry says, to to constrain people that were not the intelligentsia. So I'm a firm believer that you you give yourself permission to do something that inspires you and extraordinary that contributes that's in sustainable, fair exchange. And that's spiritual. No, that's good. The day-to-day work that one has to do to slowly improve that you have your seven principles. And I want you to run through those for us in terms of asking yourself these questions, but I'm a big believer in, you know, as as I was a spy, right. I would go out every day and I had to interact with people every day. I had to have better conversations. I had to ask better questions and just slowly getting more and more granular with my tasks. And if I didn't have capacity in that one area, like if I didn't know the right questions, that's when I would start walking in around the camp in circles, talking out loud, asking myself the questions, role-playing with myself. Right. So I had the right, the right five, six questions I needed to ask. So I love that your approach to taking these big things and determining what is important. Like you can be, you can feel horrible about the human crisis going on in Syria or in Libya, but if you actually don't do anything about it, it's just like you were saying before and your mentor taught you, like it's just a fantasy. So kind of go through those seven questions and then what does it look like when you're actually pushing towards an actual strategic goal by doing the day-to-day work? Well, first of all, I, I'm a firm believer that, that each individual has a unique set of priorities, set of values, things that are most to least important in their life. And it's fingerprint specific. It's unique to them. And identifying what that is, what you are spontaneously inspired from within to fulfill, the thing that is most meaningful to you is to me wise, just good starting point. And in the process of doing that, I ask, if I just ask somebody, what are those highest priorities in there? They'll tell you usually social idealisms, things they were taught by society and the herd instinct. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in what their life demonstrates. So I look at how they fill their space because things are really important and they keep around them and things that aren't, they discard. I look at how they spend their time. They make time, find time, and spend time on things that are really valuable, and they run out of time for things that aren't. I look at what energizes them. Their energy goes up when they're doing something high in value that goes down when you're doing something low in value. I look at where they spend their money because they, when they value it, they spend money on it. If they don't value it, they're not going to put it, their money into it. I look at what they're organized in because things that are valuable, they organize. Where they're most spontaneously disciplined. What is it that they think about, visualize, and affirm and internally dialogue to themselves about, about how they would love their life to be that shows evidence of coming true? And the key is evidence. If it doesn't show evidence, it's not really important to you. Then I look at what you want to converse with other people about most and keep wanting to bring conversations to and always want to talk about. I look at what inspires you and brings tears of inspiration or chills in your spine uh, that, that really inspire you. What's the common thread to them and the people that are common to that? I look at what are the most persistent, consistent goals that you're pursuing that are showing evidence of coming true. And I look at what you spontaneously want to learn about, read about, study, watch on YouTube. What do you want to feed your your mind with? If I look at what those 
the answers to those questions, and I get three answers per question, and looked at which ones reiterate themselves the most, second most, third most, et cetera, it gives me an idea what their life is truly demonstrating about what's important to them. And that may be in any area of life. It could be their spiritual quest. It could be their intellectual pursuits, their business pursuits, their financial well-being, their family, their social life, and leadership and influence. It could be their physical health and well-being and, and fitness. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to judge what that is, what's dominant, because everybody's needed. But finding that out and structuring your life so you can pursue and fill your day with the highest priority actions that are most meaningful to you and find a way of delegating the lower priority things. Because if you serve people doing what you really love to do and get fairly exchanged in service and be remunerated for it, you have the money to delegate lower priority things and an inspired life that's really a spiritual quest is doing what's really important and delegating the rest and giving job opportunities and helping the economy by giving other people opportunities to do the things you want to delegate and liberating yourself from the bondage that happens when you keep doing low priority things. So this is uh, how you empower your pursuit and how you build up a momentum in life and achieve more. Yeah, that's uh, lower priority things that we spend too much time on is, uh, is you know, as a guy who's got a podcast and it's a developing market, you've got a podcast and you know how hard it is to like spend time on these things. You've got to you've got to push some of that work off because what you need to be doing is talking in front of a camera and writing books. By the way, everybody, uh, John's books are available on Amazon. There's a link there. You can go there and get all of them. And I, I think there's even a book deal we're going to talk about here in a minute. But there is so much goodness in this and, and reorienting our lives. It's the new year. It's the time to do these kinds of things and and let uh, let John be your guide. And again, I want to go back to this idea of you keep track of the things that you do, the books that you read, the words that you know, the miles that you travel. Why do that? I mean, it seems like you're trying to prove something to somebody else, but I would bet that there's something more than that. Well, I would say that a, a goal that's worth pursuing is a goal worth metricing to find out what's working and not working in the pursuit. So I keep records of what I achieve. Nobody sees it except me, really. It's not about what anybody else is about. It's about I use it as a metric to find out if I'm doing what I'm saying, because if I'm not, I want to know why am I calling it a goal? If I'm not doing some sort of action on it, it's not really seriously important to me. And if I am making, uh, making you know, actions on it, I want to know what's working and not working so I can refine it, make it more efficient. So I metric everything. I do keep records. I just typed in as I got on your, your show here, I just typed it in that I'm, you know, doing Pete Turner's uh, show here. And I'm, and I wrote that down because I, it's, you're, you're helping me fulfill my objective of bringing ideas to people around the world. So thank you for that. But I, I document everything. I, I document all the things that have been important for me to pursue. I document my progress in the pursuit of it and what's working along the way and not working so I can refine it more effectively. I don't think anybody, has, I've got volumes of these documentations. Nobody's ever seen it. It's not for anybody but me right now. Somebody may look at them someday, but I do, I do it for myself as a feedback to help me become more proficient at mastering my life. And by the way, I don't do anything else but research, write, teach, travel on Zoom. Normally I'm traveling on air, but now traveling on Zoom. I don't have to do anything but that. I've delegated everything else. I don't cook. I don't, you know, wash. I don't, I haven't driven a car in over 30 years. I don't do any of those things. Everything else has been done by specialists around me so I can do what I love doing most. I want my day filled with the most inspiring actions I can do that I love doing. I don't have to do anything. I don't have anything I have to do <laughs> except I'm doing what I love to do, which is basically researching, writing, and teaching. You watch a lot of TV then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't. Uh, the only time I'm, I'm watching TV is if I just happen to do a show and just to see how I did as feedback. And occasionally I'll get asked to go to some sort of a movie or something like that. But I, I rarely I rarely do television. I've been in a hotel for quite a while and that's never even been turned on. Yeah, I'm very similar in that. You know, when I do watch TV, I do it to spend time with my, my significant other or whatever, or there's some kind of research because we'll have a, a movie guest on or something like that. But yep. I don't have a bunch of shows. And, and when I start to watch something and I, you know, kind of get drawn into the TV, I realize I need to be creating. That's my job. I don't need to I don't need to watch someone else's creation. I need to I mean, it's fine to do that. But 
you know, I need to be writing, recording. I'm not a spectator. I'm a participant. I like to, I like to do it. I'd much rather produce something in a day. I mean, nobody has to remind me to do my research. I do it every day. I'm doing it 48 years. Nobody has to remind me to, to, to write. I do that every day. Nobody has to remind me to do some sort of presentation. You know, I'll do a few podcasts in a day. I've got three today. You know, I sometimes do five in a day, whatever, whatever it takes to get the message out. So I don't, I don't, I don't have anything that I require to do that is a got to. I don't live by shoulds, ought to, supposed tos, got tos, have tos, must, need tos. I'm doing what I love doing. I've I found a way of producing with it. I found a way of delegating other things. I'd rather give job opportunities to other people and let specialists do what they love doing and do a greater job than what I would be doing and no longer burden me by things that depreciate. Because anytime you do low priority things, you devalue yourself. Anytime you do things that are highest on your values that inspire you, you value yourself. So why would you want to devalue your life? It doesn't make sense. No, I love that. I'm working on becoming better at that myself. And when I see my friends do it, you know, just because you can doesn't mean that you need to, you know, and, and hire somebody else and do what you do. The podcast world is the same thing. If you have someone that's like, I want to start a podcast to make money. And I'm like, you should probably just do what you already do to make money because the path to money is long and not reliable, you know? And so if you're famous, go do what makes you famous more, you know? <laughs> I, I, I'm known for delegating everything. I have a kind of a joke. I, I joked about it because I traveled a lot. And um, so I said, you know, my girlfriend, I said, I'm not always here to be with my girlfriend at 20, 24 hours a day kind of thing. I'm not a guy that's always around every day. So I said, look, if you if you need to make love, if I was to get you Hugh Jackman on my behalf and delegate Hugh Jackman or Brad Pitt to take care of the lovemaking, would you still love me? And she said, yes, I'd love you even more. <laughs> so I, I'm known for delegating that. And that was a joke. That wasn't a real thing. But I'm, <laughs> for sure. the, the point is that, that why, why do something that's desperate when you can do something that's inspired? It doesn't make sense to me. But that, that, that brings accountability. You know what the accountability is? To find out what is highest on your priorities right. is deeply meaningful. And how do I do it in a way that serves ever greater numbers of people in a sustainable, fair exchange manner? So I'm remunerated beautifully and scaled to serve ever greater numbers of people in a way that I'm doing what I love and getting handsomely paid for it so I can give job opportunities to people that I can delegate to and keep building what I'm capable of doing through the help of other people. You said something interesting a few minutes ago, and I wanted to go back to it. You travel via Zoom. Everybody's reinventing how they live their lives right now. And heck, we're not nowhere near out of this thing. So what the heck does that mean, traveling via Zoom? Well, I, I've had the opportunity to travel by plane, my jet. I've been, I've traveled 20 million miles. I've, I've logged by jet. I've spoken in 154 countries. So I've done a bit of travel. But now on Zoom, since uh, the you know COVID, same COVID, I've had the opportunity to reach nearly all those same countries live on Zoom presentations. So I'm not short on uh, travel today. It's just that I don't have to do it by the plane. Now I love flying, so when the planes come back and and the normal flying is around, I'll be back to flying probably. I also sail, you know, because I live on a ship. But the the reality is that I'm now getting to travel the world by these social media structures like Zoom and whatever this one is. This is uh, StreamYard, I think. And, That's right. and um, so whatever vehicle, whatever way it allows it. I was recently teaching one of my signature programs, The Break to Expect. I had a guy outside with satellite overlooking a river in Madagascar, a guy in Kazakhstan, a guy in Mongolia, somebody in Japan, somebody in Australia, somebody in New Zealand, somebody in London, somebody in Germany. Some in Italy, Spain, United States, Canada, Mexico. We had people from all over the world, 12,000 people on from all over the world. We logged it. There's 121 countries were on that particular part of that presentation. 121 countries at one time. That's more efficient travel. So I'm, I thank you, thank COVID, <laughs> because it's, it's uh, made more, it's stepped us up in efficiency. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's incredible. You think how easy it is. You can literally go find someone in the city that you want to travel to. And since you can't go to Milan right now, you can absolutely find someone in Milan who will walk you around their city, whether it's virtually or they literally take their iPhone and walk around town and and show you the Duomo and, and Teatro alla Scala. And, you know, you can literally go on a tour and then at some point be like, I know these people now. And now you land there. It's like now you're in Milan and you have friends. You know? Yeah, there's there's so many things. When COVID came in, in March, I sent out a letter to thousands of students around the world. And I said, you know, whatever blessings that are emerging uh, send in a list of the blessings that you're observing. Because if you're, if you count your blessings and are grateful for what you have, you get to, more to be grateful for. And 17,000 benefits, blessings came in for my students, 17,000. Now, a lot of these were the same and repeated. So I had to discard some and they were just duplicated. So I kind of did a, a reiteration process as they came in. I just put a slash, 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 slash line slash, 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 to see what were the most common benefits people were getting. It was quite impressive. And it was, and then I shared that with some people, not all of it, but shared part of it with people to let them know these are the blessings that are coming in to help people not focus on the problem, but to focus on the solution. Because some people were wanting to be victims of history instead of masters of destiny. And if you see things in the way and not on the way, you trap yourself. You burden yourself, not because of what's out there. We have control over our perceptions, decisions, and actions in life. We can take whatever is happening out around us, and we can ask how specifically is whatever is happening, the facts of what's right now on my plate, how is it helping me fulfill my mission in the world? How is it helping me serve? And if you answer that question and hold yourself accountable, you can be brought to tears of gratitude for almost anything that's ever happened in your life. And so to me, that's being resourceful. And I encourage people to not let the outer world impact them. I said on The Secret many years ago, when the voice and the vision on the inside is louder than all opinions on the outside, you begin to master your life. But if you watch all the so the media out there and it sensates extremes and causes polarizations in order to sell media, you can get swayed with subjective biases and not get objective facts and miss out on the opportunities that are at hand. Yeah, I uh... I can appreciate you saying that because that is a lot of what we see. I mean, the less you consume this media and the more you focus on what's truly important to you. And if you don't know what that is and you're sort sorted out, you know, that's the journey, right? Like find what it is that matters to you. Well, and, quit, uh, quit so, yeah. lying to yourself that you don't know. I've been teaching the Breakthrough Experience 32 years. Nice. And there are people every week, and I teach this class almost every week. And, and, this, and people will say, well, I don't know what I want to dedicate my life to. No, you have the fear of not knowing, not having a degree, not have education enough, and you're comparing yourself to somebody that you are exaggerating their intelligence, and therefore you're minimizing your own. And so you have the fear of not being smart enough. You have the fear of failure, or you're not going to succeed at it. You have the fear of losing money or not making money at it. You have the fear of what your family will think, your fear of what society will reject, you're frightened about whether you have the looks or the vitality, the energy to pull it off, or you're frightened about what somebody's going to label it as moral and ethical about it. And you're letting those fears of other people that you're subordinating to interfere with what you know in your heart you want to contribute. But I've, I haven't seen somebody that really down deep inside didn't know what they wanted to do, but they, they lie to themselves. And I confront that in the breakthrough experience and make them face the truth about it and quit giving off and disempower in their life. Because any area of your life you don't empower, people will overpower. And then you're sitting there playing victim of history. Instead of realizing that the frustrations of the world around you that's being imposed on you is because you're not standing up and speaking out about what it is you can, you're can you committed to and focusing on service solutions. And I guess you would add to that too, like measuring what you're actually doing too as you sort these things out. Again, like the, those seven questions are fantastic. Well, if you're not asking questions and, and measuring what your contribution is, you're not going to appreciate what you can do, your difference. I, I, can I share a story? I, I, uh, I, had, I had a gentleman, a young boy, not a gentleman, but a young boy, attend one of my Inspired Destiny programs, Young Adults Inspired Destiny program. He was a teenager. He came from a very poor rural family, 800 miles away. The guy traveled literally over a one-day period just to get to the talk. He believed that when he came to the talk, there were kids from rich and poor. 
uh, areas all of a sudden withdrew and kind of, you know, played small. And I asked him, I picked on him and I said, okay, so, you know, are you aware of the impact you have on the world? He goes, no. And I said, well, what, what do you do in a day? Let's take anything you do. He says, well, sometimes I go to the store and I go buy soap for my mom. Okay, great. Have you realized the impact you have on the world just by doing that? He goes, by buying a, a plastic piece of soap, covered soap? And uh, stop. When you manufacture the soap, you've got to make a manufacturing plant. Somebody has to design that. You got engineers designing it. You got builders building it. You got road people building a road to get to it. You got asphalt. You got cement. You got steel. All those companies need companies and they have building plastic manufacturing, design systems, educational systems. And I, and I took him from that little purchasing of a bar of soap to how it ripple effects across the world. And I said, by you buying a, a bar of soap, there's nobody in the world that's not impacted. Arthur Eddington said, when the electron vibrates, the whole universe shakes. And people don't realize their contribution and they, they, they minimize it by comparing themselves to others instead of actually stopping and looking what they're doing on a daily basis and how is it a step forward into what's meaningful to them. Mm. And that's, that's a major difference. And he, when he got through, he realized, wow, he gave me a piece of paper with his name on it that he signed. He says, you're going to want my autograph. I'm so important. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. One of the things that I, I try to get folks to think about as I try to do my portion of helping folks is to collect wonder and joy and awe as opposed to misery and pain and suffering. Because it's so easy to collect the negative stuff. But if you at least force some of the goodness in, not that you won't have bad things happen, You've got a pile of goodness that you can say, oh, yeah, the last five times I had wonder in my life were and then you could just go down the list. You know, like I saw the ocean the other day. I, I live in Orange County, but I slow down because some people never even get to see it, put their feet in it. And so I always slow down and go, there it is. There's the Pacific Ocean. And it's always gorgeous. It's always uplifting. And it always it gives me you know, a moment to pause and let the ocean does what it does for all people, all of you. So true. Can I share another story? <laughs> I hope you would. I was 28 and I was in a really, quote, distressed, stressful moment. And um, I went out to see my dad and mom out their house. And my dad said, you look like you're a bit stressed, son. I said, I'm super stressed. And, I, and he said, what's happening? And I said, well, I just, I'm in the pro process of expanding my office and the construction is driving me absolutely batty. There's dust everywhere. It's noise everywhere. I'm trying to serve clients. I, the, the cost of a new loan, the payment of the previous loan. I just bought a new house. I just got a new car. That was a surprise purchase that my wife surprised me with. We've now got a baby coming. I've now inherited a son. She wants to go on a honeymoon. I, I'm, I've got a trip to Hawaii. Uh, I've had to get two rings. You got to pay for the trip. And my business has dropped 30%. And I'm just super stressed. And, I, and I, I'm just overwhelmed by what's going on. I had to hire new people. I'm having to pay uh, tax money that I didn't expect because I didn't plan for it properly. And he just went on and on and on and on about it. Well, I went on and on about it. And my dad's just sitting there patiently. And he said, son, those don't sound like stressings. Those sound like blessings. I said, what do you mean? And this is what he said to me, and it really made a difference. I put it in an early book of mine. He said, you have a brand new house that's bigger than I have, and you're half my age, and you got this big, beautiful house already. I've never been able to give your mother that type of house. You have a new car. I didn't have a car for the first four years we were married. You have landscaping. You have two new rings. It was the 25th year anniversary before your mother got a real diamond ring. You're on a vacation to Hawaii. It was our 25th year anniversary before we took a Mexico trip. He said, you got issues. You got to pay taxes, son. That means you made money. You had to borrow loans. That means you have credit. He says, the idea that you're expanding your office means that you're serving people. And you have the opportunity to do that. And that should be grateful, the idea of business. The idea that it's temporary down is probably because your attitude is down. Probably the universe is protecting people from being in your presence when you're in a stinking thinking mood. Anyway, he had a way of shifting every single thing that I was looking at. 
and see it from a different perspective. I cried at that moment. I hugged my dad. I said, wow, that's the most, one of the most significant things you could have ever said to me. And my, my perception shifted. Nothing in the outer world shifted except my perception. And I immediately was no longer stressed. I was grateful for what I did. My business returned very rapidly. And I upgraded my entire life experience because of one change in perspective. William James said the greatest discovery of his generation is that human beings can alter their lives by altering their perceptions and attitudes and mind. So this is St. Corona to me, not Corona. This is an opportunity time, not a devastation. And it's not, to, I'm not talking about being positive thinking, because if I see somebody that's manic, I want to know the downsides, calm them down again, because they're blinded by the down, they're blinded to the downsides. They're infatuated with the upsides. But when you're in the downside, you're blind to the upsides. So you need to be able to know how to balance out your mind and see both sides of life. And my dad helped me see both sides at that moment. And it shifted the trajectory and the momentum of a completely takeoff. I mean, it was like a launch pad that moment. And my business grew and my economics grew. Everything grew as a result of that one turning point and a realization of that's how you look at life. How'd your pop figure that out? That's, that's pretty brilliant. Yeah, I, I was, but well, he had a situation when he was, when he got back from the, the service back after World War II, he had a dream to go to California. And he set out getting on buses to go to California. He wanted to go out there where you are. He got stuck and he had to get a job in San Antonio, Texas on his way to California. And when he did, he ended up meeting my mom at Hudson Engineering Company where he had to get a job. And they end up, you know, deciding they got moved to Houston. And then they end up there and having me and my mom and my sister and um, their life. And my father never made it to California his entire life. Not once did he ever travel to California. When I was 14 years old and I told my dad that I'm headed to California, my mom and dad signed a documented piece of paper in front of a notary that my son is a boy with a dream. He wants to ride big waves. He has no family relatives in California. And they dropped, they gave that document to me, signed by a notary, put it in my pocket and said, don't lose this. Keep $13 in your pocket because I can't put you in for vagrancy and go do your dream. You go to California because he never made it. He wanted me to make sure I never, not, he wanted to make sure that I reached the goal I was setting out for. Yeah, that's great. We had Rob Paulson on the show. Rob Paulson is one of the uh, the greatest voice actors in all of Hollywood. He's done all the characters, you know, Pinky in the Brain, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He's done all of it. And his grandfather gave him similar advice because his grandfather came across from Europe during the war, World War II. And, you know, there were submarines and ships were being sunk and all that stuff. And he's like, yeah, whatever. Like, yeah, that's what I have to do. And he said, just go out there to Hollywood. And you've got a big ocean called the Pacific. Let it pacify you. And it's like, how did Grandpa know all that stuff? But, you know, but he had perspective because he had he had risked it all, and he had done something dangerous in traveling across an ocean and a continent during a war, and it worked out because you know he had the the faith in himself and everything else, and he took that action. Why didn't your dad go to California? Do you think ever? I mean, he had the opportunity. He went to Mexico. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. Why didn't your dad go to California, do you think, ever? I mean, he had the opportunity. He went to Mexico. He never went. I think... When I went, he was living vicariously through me, though, because all he wanted to do is he wanted to know what it was like to go to California. And he says, are all, all the girls pretty out there like he, he was told? <laughs> I said, yes. In 1968, there was a free love days on the Huntington Beach. It was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. But, but uh, yeah, I think, I think he got focused on what he was doing. He, he owned a plumbing business and he just got, you know, caught in the. And kind of the day-to-day -day routine of a plumbing business, raising a family and stuff. 
and it became less important to him. I think as an adventure, it was important to him, but afterwards it was just less important. I mean, I, I know he could have done it, but he just didn't. But I know that up until the time when I was 14, he still dreamed about it. Your um, your work kind of reminds me of Peter Drucker. I don't know if you know who Peter Drucker is, but he's like the godfather of management. And he wrote a zillion books and was always learning and always evolving. And so you read his earlier books and you see him completely flip what he said and what he believed over the years. How have you, like, what's your Druckian journey? I mean, how have you evolved with, because you've written so much, you're always adding new things in with all these books that you're reading and life experiences. How have you evolved? Well, it, I think it's a slight tweaking constantly. I can't say I've had a major flip. I was more into kind of positive thinking and mentality up until I was around 30. But that I did a research project on that, and I realized more I'm a little bit more and more of a balanced, objective thinker today, not uh, a pie in the sky kind of thing. But I'm a firm believer that, that everything has two sides. And if you're conscious of the upside and blind to the downside, or conscious of the downside, blind to the upside, it's time to open up your eyes and get past your blindness and see things objectively. Because there's neither positive nor negative can be by itself. There's always two sides to it. So I've gotten a, that probably as a refinement. And of course, it's just expanded as you grow. It's, it's like, you know, you, you first, I like to think of it this way. When you first go to first grade class and you go to science class in elementary school, you find out in the front of the room is a, a chart with a bunch of atoms on it. And you think, okay, you got a small hydrogen, you got a large uranium, and each of these are bigger balls. And you see sticks with balls and bonds. And you see these and you think, okay, atoms are little balls. Then you go on to high school and you find out, no, there's a Bohr atom. It's got a proton, neutron, electron, and it's like a little solar system. And then you go on to college and you find out, well, now it's got quantum numbers, complex mathematical quantum numbers that are probability distributions of a possibility of where an electron might be and where these waves and particles are. And a complementation of, of a, you know, Niels Bohr model goes there. And then you go on to prof you know, your PhD or something like that and you find out, well, there's flaws in that model. You can't have point charges that are electronic, they're infinities, and you've got quantum field theory. And, and uh, these are perturbations and measurements of field theories. And it's a very abstract mathematics. It goes from concrete little balls to very abstract mathematics. So I think it's normal as you learn that you awaken your IQ, which is your relevant quotient, I mean, your, your reverence quotient, to more abstract understanding and more abstract models. So I think that's, I've gotten deeper in my assessment and understanding of the universe, and I've transcended some stages of the way you view things. And I think that, but you, the more you know, the more you know you don't know, the more mysteries you keep probing into. And so you get more humbled as you go, the more knowledgeable you get, I think the more humbled you become. Yeah, this is great. And I love that you brought in quantum physics into this because we've had a lot of these kind of guests on the show. And one of them was a guy, he's, he's passed, but his name was Dr. Andrew Friedman, a young guy. And they did uh, the cosmic bell test and they figured out that with their test, they, they used distant galaxies as a random number generator, on, off, on, off, right? And they couldn't, they actually confirmed or pushed the needle closer to entanglement. You know, these things were more connected than they weren't beyond a level of randomness. You think about that. And that means you have to give some, some things up in your life. And these are Einstein principles, but you know, the natural rule, there's not what we believe it is. We're learning more and more that how much DNA impacts who we are and how random DNA can be, you know, like some old gene from a great, great grandfather comes through and it gives you this different characteristic pattern. You know, these things matter. And then our entanglement, you talked about things vibrating in the universe. We really are we're finding out all the time, more and more. Uh, NASA just did a released a study about teleportation. This is not faster than the speed of light. It's instant. These things know each other instantly. This is happening all the time. You know, our understanding is improving of, of quantum everything, including quantum gravity, which apparently is a thing now. And I, I can't wait to learn more about that. If what continues to happen, you know, what seems to be happening continues to happen. You know, we realize that DNA is a lot more um, of a driver of who we are and how we act. If we are a lot more connected and getting more so every time we publish a new paper, what does that mean for our future, man? Well, I think there's, there's been much of the debate for the centuries of nature versus nurture. This has been going on, you know, 
millennia, actually, two and a half millennia, nature versus nurture. And we know that there's genetics, which is the nurture, and epigenetics, which is the nature. And we know that's multi-generational both. So we have now multi-generational epigenetics that is now superimposed on top of multi, well, not multi, but for billions of years, the genetic evolution process. So yeah, and, and realizing that we, with our perceptions, are affecting epigenetics. Epigenetics is, is coded by neurotransmitters affecting cell walls. And these, are tra- these transmitters are impacted by our perceptions. We change our perception. We change the methylation, acetylation, simulation um, of these, these histones and DNA and the expression of DNA. So we literally can change our perceptions and attitudes about life and change a gene expression. And, in, and now we know that the gene expression, even mutations, can be actually initiated, not randomly, by some sort of a radiation or toxic chemical stratagem, but now can be induced duplications, deletions, crossovers. Many types of DNA that was once called random mutations are now being understood to actually having a, a causal dynamic. Yeah. So we are more profoundly impacted and impactful by our and on our DNA as we evolve. It's a, one of the great mysteries. And they do. There is entanglement apparently going on even between the strands of DNA, which are complementary and opposite held together by hydrogen bonds. Those, those are actually, in a sense, entangled complementary opposite strands, the allyl Components are, are complementary opposite strands in DNA that, that are just af- astonishing when you stop and think about it. So the quantum world and quantum biology is overlapping now. It used yeah. to be falling down in the nanometer and femtometer range, but Too now big. you're looking in the large scales, we're finding quantum entanglement occurring at 12,000 miles apart in between. And, and, and the particular universe by John Wheeler, he believed it was the whole universe. If it came from a, a single source, it's all entangled. Who knows? Maybe the whole universe is entangled and we're all connected that way. This is, this is a, yeah, a really great. I love that we're talking about these things because we are, you know, of the epigenetic world, you know, some of the cures for cancer that are coming out for like geoblastoma, one of the most horrible cancers there is. You know, we've had a guy named Attila Haidu on the show before, and he's talking about epigenetic-based cures where they're going to reset your epigenetics back to no cancer. And so take these cancer cells and just reprogram them back which means that if you can do that with, with an injection of you know your own good cells and everything, it means you also can give yourself cancer at some point. Like Absolutely. the things, not not just food, but how you approach life in general. And this is exactly what you were saying a minute ago. In in 1979, I did a presentation at the Shamrock Hilton Hotel, which is a very large hotel at the time. MD Anderson Hospital was putting it on. It was 1,000 oncologists from around the world were speaking. I got one to be one of the guest speakers. And I gave my evolutionary theory, taking primarily War- Warburg's and St. Georgie's work on cancer proliferation. I gave my theory about cancer back then. I was 24 years old. Everybody in the room was 50s, 60s, and 70s. Right. Epstein, Samuel Epstein was sitting in the front row. He was one of the leaders in the field at the time. And it had a major impact on society and its relationship to teratogens and toxic materials and cancer at the time. It was way ahead of his field. And I had the opportunity to present an evolutionary theory that was pre-epigenetic, that wasn't called so much epigenetics in those days, pre-epigenetic idea about what initiated cancer and what could do it. We now know that when the cell, the male and female, you know, sperm and egg unite, makes the zygote, and it starts to divide those cells and differentiate those cells that every one of those have slightly different signal molecules connecting those cells and signaling to to new differentiation, which is epigenetic. That's where epigenetics originate. And every one of those signal molecules are now identified enough to be able to move the cell forward or backward, regress, progress, back and forth through time and take a skin cell and make a heart cell, make a heart cell into a lung cell. We can take any cell and almost convert in any other cell today. So cancer is a regression to a primitive embryological and phylogenetic stage of development within cells, a trophoblastic cell inside the embryology, 
and also a what they call a metazoa one two junction in early uh, you know phylogeny. These cells are actually able to be moved back and forth. So yes, that's that is the future. We're going to be able to take a cancer cell, understand the signal molecules, play with the signal molecules, and transform it, move it forward and backward. And that's already being happened. It's already starting. Yeah, no, it is. I mean, until this, until this company and any other number of other companies, and, and then also our ability to care for ourselves with an epigenetic base. We have another guy, uh, Tracy Gappin, is a doctor. And he talks about your specific programming. You know, you need to eat a diet that consists of these things more specifically. By the way, knock off the sugar. Sugar is never part of it. But Sugar perpetuates these cancers. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and also, you know, lack of oxygen and excess sugar, they, they perpetuate them. They're not just causal, but they're definitely perpetuators. Yeah. But, yeah. but we have shocks, emotional shocks that occur in our life that can tag epigenetically our cells during embryology that can be reactivated by emotional, quote, traumas that we have and, and regress us back. We, we, so, yeah, we need to be accountable for our perceptions and learn how to balance our perceptions and I, I'm a firm believer that if you go to bed at night and you're not grateful for your day, it's time to get back up again and think about how you experienced your day and ask whatever questions it takes to balance out your perception so you can go to bed with gratitude. Otherwise, you're carrying and perpetuating your own illness. And the illness is a feedback mechanism to guide you back to authenticity. It's used by your body to try to wake you up to see things as they are, not as you misperceived them. I love it. I mean, this is such a great chat, man. I I, I appreciate your uh, you're well, obviously you're well read, and you don't need me to tell you that because you got a chart that proves it to you. But the, just the overall breadth of knowledge and how much in control of our lives we really are or can be, you know, and that's that gives us all hope. It's like I really can have more control. I really can, you know continue to prioritize and do the things that feed my soul and allow me to create a better community around me. I mean, these, if, if a lot more of us were doing this, there'd be a lot less bigger problems because we would all be focused on this, uh, this slow incremental improvement of us and the things around us. It's not necessarily a stoic philosophy, but if you're resilient to outside harms, you, you really can focus on those things. And then when you have enough purchase in your life, you can start to really, and you already have, start impacting other lives in a way that is exponential in terms of the goodness that you create. That's it. Well, you know, Marcus Aurelius, who is sort of a stoic, uh, was known for saying, it's not what happens to it, it's our perception of it. And I love Epictetus, who is also sort of a semi-stoic. Epictetus said, you know, you, you start out in life in your journey, you blame others. Then eventually you blame yourself. And then you eventually realize there was nothing to blame. The illusion was there was something to blame. There was a hidden order in there. As Leibniz said, there was a divine perfection. He was a theological angle, but he said there's a divine perfection. David Bohm would call it the hidden order, the implicate order, but there's a hidden order in things. And when you see that and you're in awe and you're inspired, you have resilience, adaptability, and profound power to, to transcend whatever you think is in the way. I love that. Hey, everybody should go check out drdmartini.com. There is so much stuff on your website. Oh, my God. <laughs> you, you create, I mean, there's stacks of books and there's blogs and there's podcasts and there's courses. I mean, you guys can feast for hours on, on John's uh, website. So definitely go over there as a resource. But also check out, and I'll put it here in the, uh, in the, in the queue, check out his YouTube page too, because there's a lot of more of those kind of things. All you got to do is just set this stuff, listen to a lecture a day, and you're going to have a better mindset, a better way to kind of go forward in life and get these books, you guys. Seriously. I mean, this is, um, you know, you all that listen to the show a lot, you know, I, I don't hype stuff that I don't believe in, but I really love what John has created. John, we're just about to wrap up here. Anything in closing? You want to ask me any questions? What do you want to do? Well, just whoever is listening or viewing First of all, thank you for supporting um, this this endeavor. But just know you want to give yourself permission to be you. you. You know, the magnificence of who you are is far greater than any fantasies you'll ever impose on yourself that you might inject from by comparing yourself to other people. So prioritize your life. Do what's really important. Ask yourself, what is the highest priority action I can be doing right now with the resources I have? to serve the greatest number of people in the most efficient, effective way. And stick to that on a daily basis. And, and also on my website, drdmartini.com, 
there's a complementary value determination process to help you look at what is really important to you and what your life really demonstrates is meaningful to you. You might want to check that out. It's complimentary. It's private. It takes about 30 minutes of your time, but it's worth the time. And also, I, I mentioned that there's a little, uh, I believe, a little uh, CD that we're a giveaway that we're giving for people. Yeah, that's that, right. Do you, yeah. Can I mention comment? I was speaking in so- Johannesburg, South Africa, to a YPO group, Young Presidents Organization. And I was in a planetarium. And the topic was awaking your astronomical vision. See, if, you're, if you want to make a difference in yourself, you need a vision at least as big as your family. If you want to make a difference in your family, you need a vision as big as your community. If you want to make a difference in your community, you need a vision as big as your city. If you want to make a difference in the city, you mean number one in the city, you need a vision as big as your state. If you want to be number one in the state, you need a national vision. If you want to make a difference in the nation, you need a global vision. But if you want to make a global difference, which is inevitable today with all the social media and things, it's time to have an astronomical vision. So this little CD is a gift. And I am absolutely certain you'll probably listen to it five or six times. That's what most people are saying. And it's about expanding your vision and giving yourself permission to do something extraordinary on planet Earth and digging inside you because you know you want to make a difference, but you're not maybe as clear as you could be. And you don't have your strategy possibly in place, or you may have these anxieties stopping you. But I just know that this little CD can help transform playing small into something pretty extraordinary if you would love to do that. It's there for you if you do it. It's a, it's a complimentary little gift that I just know if you. If you take the time to listen to it, it's going to have an impact on the way you think. Yeah, and I'll put the link for that thing in the show notes when you guys look. If you're on the uh, podcast side, just look in the show notes and you'll see that CD. And we'll we'll get that out here on the live side, too, and I'll put it in the show notes as well. Hey, I appreciate you coming on, man. That was awesome. I I didn't know we were going to get to talk about epigenetics and quantum, quantum anything, quantum everything. I, I, I love pushing myself with that topic because it's... It's incredible, the, the leaps and bounds that are happening. And we're all part of it. It's a great time to be alive. It is amazing. Uh, I, there's so much to be grateful for on a daily basis. That's why I keep an ongoing record. It's 26 volumes of gratitudes, 10.1 inch margins that I keep every, every day documented. Because I'm a firm believer that if you're grateful for what you have, you get more to be grateful for.